Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another weekly poker showdown brought to you by Party Poker. I'm your host, Jamie Staples. This week on the show, we have Maria Konnikova, uh, incredible person, incredible story. She's coming out with a brand new poker book called The Biggest Bluff on June 23rd. So I was sent a copy, uh, and I read it, and I love it. It's amazing. So I talked to her about the book and her journey in poker, and um, I think you'll you'll love this conversation. So stick around for that. But before we get to the talk with Maria, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on in the online poker world over the last week. Let's start off with the Mike Postel case. So this week, um, the Mike Postel cheating allegation that went on and, and lawsuit that was happening uh, was granted a motion to dismiss uh, in in the u.s so really from my perspective uh not fair justice wasn't served uh from my perspective uh, everything that i saw was pretty clear cut from my perspective uh clearly the judge disagreed and i find it really disappointing to be honest i, I think it really sucks for the people that uh were allegedly cheated out of money um you know the fact that the judge sided with postal on on the case um Makes me feel bad, to be honest, and I feel bad for the people that that uh, were asserting that they were victims in that situation. Uh, Judge William B. Shrub ruled quintessential gambling losses are barred from recovery by California public policy, which opens up a very difficult debate in terms of well, how protected are people that are playing poker uh, in California? You know, if that's the policy that applies, I mean, it's really legally opening up a door to people being cheated in all sorts of games, and uh, to me, really a scary precedent to set, uh, or or scary precedent that has been set in the past. I'm not sure as to whether this is new or, or in the past. So, really unfortunate news there. I'm curious as to what you think. I know there's some people out there that defend Mike Postel. To me, um, I am really struggling to empathize with that perspective. But nonetheless, I'd love to hear from you. In online poker news this week, we have $53 million have been won by players in the WPT Online Championships, uh, the first ever. I mean, it was an amazing series to take part in. I absolutely loved it, even though I bubbled the main event. And it hurts. It hurts. Kings to Ace-10. I snuck a bad beat into this podcast. I'm hoping Eric Seidel listens to the podcast because Maria's on it. You'll hear all about it. I'm sorry for the bad beat, Eric Seidel. I know I'm not, I'm not supposed to do it. I had to sneak it in. Kings to Ace-10. Uh, anyways, Chris, Christian Jepsen won the WPT Online Championship for more than $923,000. So uh, a huge success for that series. On some of the other sites around the internet, we have PokerStar Summer Series uh, starting up, I think, a couple days ago it started. $25 million in guarantees from the 7th to the 21st. So they have a brand new series there. World Series of Poker.com Online a Final Circuit Series uh, has finished up. So... Uh, Another successful series there, but I'm really looking forward to the summer. Should be quite interesting to see what happens. Uh, World Series of Poker announcing that uh, they're running bracelet events over on GG. And of course, the, the World Poker Tour online championships happening on Party Poker this summer. Uh, I think it's going to be a pretty awesome summer for online poker, so I'm really excited to take part. That's it for the online poker news this week, so let's get into the conversation with Maria. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She has uh, three books previously, and this is her fourth book called The Biggest Bluff. Uh, we used to be teammates over at Poker Stars in the past, and she's rocketed from not knowing anything about the game of poker to huge success over such a short period of time, and someone that knew nothing about the game. So to have her be a, a writer, uh, an author, and journal the experience basically right the experience of what it's like to know nothing to play at a high level it brought back all of those incredible feelings that i had when i first got into the game the discovery of different concepts and and the mistakes that you make and and the learnings that come from them and and then a lot of insight as well from from her career uh having a phd in psychology i mean there's there's so much that i found i could learn from her and who managed to be her mentor eric seidel I just thought it was such a valuable experience and uh, the conversation as well that we have today was really great, sort of asking her some of the questions I had about the journey in the book and, and what she's learned from it all. So without further ado, enjoy my conversation with Maria Konnikova. Joining me on the podcast today, I have Maria Konnikova. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me, Jamie. I'm really glad to be here. So you sent me a book, uh, your book, The Biggest Bluff that's coming out last week when I said I was going to come on the show. Uh, you know, and I load it up. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be cool. Read the book. And I absolutely love it. 
I think it's amazing. Um, I'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast. I'm serious. Everyone out there, <laughs> if you like poker or if you just enjoy reading in any regard, you need to, you need to pick up the book. Um, Thank you. So I could ask you a ton of stuff, but I want to go back to your journey of getting into poker. You know, you mm -hmm. never played poker three, four yeah. years ago. Zero. Uh, yep. and, and you learn about the journey uh, throughout the book. So deciding to embark on this mission of starting to play poker, like what, why? Why poker? <laughs> a question for the ages. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, if you, had, if you had stopped me in the street like four years ago and be like, hey, Maria, um, guess what? you're going to be a professional poker player in just a few years. I would have said, ha, such a funny joke, you joker. <laughs> um, what is poker again? Um, that's how little I knew about it and how little interest I had in it. I mean, honestly, I think the only poker game I'd ever seen was Rounders. Right. <laughs> that was really, yeah. that was my, I was like, oh, that's poker, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Everyone looks like John Malkovich or, or Matt Damon. Um, and um, you know, all the underground clubs, you got the worms, exactly. all of it. I mean, it's a yeah, classic. or worm. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, great movie, by the way. Um, but that was my that was my only knowledge of the poker world. And I came to it by chance. Um, and the, the funny thing is, it, it's because I became interested in chance it's in luck, the role that it plays in our lives how we can learn to tell the difference between the things we can control and the things we can't control, you know, how, how we can learn to maximize our skill and how we can learn to just be okay with just the stuff that happens that we just have no control over. And the reason I became interested in that is because, you know, I was just really thinking about the role that luck has played in my life in both directions, you know, how lucky I was, to have been born in the first place, but that my parents left the Soviet Union. I mean, I'd be a very different person if they hadn't. And that was totally not up to me. I mean, yay parents, thank you. <laughs> you brought me to the US um, and I could have had a very different life. Um, so, so I think I've had a lot of luck along the way, um, but the things that made me stop and think were bad luck because I think that we, we often just take good luck for granted. Mm. It's like in poker, you know, now that now that I do know poker, let me just skip ahead a bit. You know, when you're running well, you, you just think I'm a god, I'm a brilliant, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a genius. This is what my life's supposed to be. This is exactly, it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Tournaments are easy. I love tournaments. This is amazing. You know, I'm going to win everything forever. I figured it out. I'm in the zone. And really, you're just running like god. Um, you're not actually god. So, so that's... Um, that's kind of the, I feel like that's a good analogy to um, how we often deal with good luck when it's happening in life. We're like, yep, I'm really good. I'm talented. I'm working hard. You know, I'm getting the success. Everything is great. Mm -hmm. Then when, when shit hits the fan, when bad things start happening, you're like, uh oh, wait, I guess, I guess I was being very lucky and now I'm not. Right. And all of a sudden I have to think about that. Well, I think that's and, a very healthy reaction because yeah. some people say I'm not I'm just getting unlucky. Not I was yes. getting lucky. Like, oh, something's wrong now. <laughs> you know, like, what, this is true. What this is happens? true. And that, you're right. You're right. And that's true both in life and in poker. Right. There are some people who are like, oh, man, I'm just running like shit. I'm still brilliant. Right. Mm. I don't have to reconsider my uh, study habits or my poker habits at all. Um, this is just variance. And maybe it is, but sometimes it isn't. Anyway, um, so I started reading about luck because I decided I wanted to write about it. And someone suggested I start reading up on game theory. They said, you know, game theory is a really interesting way of looking at this. It's a great framework. And I said, oh, framework. I like frameworks. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> yeah. um, and I um, came across John von Neumann's theory of games, which is kind of the book of game theory. So John von Neumann is the father of game theory. Um, and I learned very early on, you know, right, right from the first pages, um, John von Neumann shares that he's a poker player. And not only is he a poker player, but poker was actually the foundation of game theory. He realized that poker was the perfect way to look at strategic decision making in life because chess actually is not a great way of doing it because chess is a game of perfect information. It's a game where you see the board, you see all the moves, you see all the pieces, and there's always a right move, theoretically, you can solve yeah. it. You know, you can, you can figure it out if you have enough computing power. Um, and in life, there's not, you know, and chess is very useful for other things. Chess is a beautiful, beautiful game. I don't want to detract from chess, but 
um, when you're talking about life, normally decisions aren't like that. You don't have the full chessboard. You don't see mm. all the pieces. You know, some of the pieces are missing. Sometimes you think something's a queen, but really it's a bishop in disguise or, or whatever right. it is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that's poker. So poker is a game of incomplete information. There's what I know, there's what you know, there's what we know in common. And we have to make decisions knowing that the information is not complete, knowing that we're never going to know everything, knowing that there's this element of uncertainty. And that mirrors the way that we make decisions in life. I mean, that's what decision making in life is about, because in life, there is no such thing as perfect information. There is no such thing as 100 percent certainty ever. No, it's life, right. Um, and so he said, this game is perfect. I love this game. He he loved poker. He said, I'm going to solve it. If I can solve it, um, you know, I'll have a way of looking at the most difficult decisions in the world. That's obviously, amazing. No limit hold, yeah. And obviously, No Limit Hold'em still hasn't been solved. Mm. So it's kind of the gold standard for AI research these days. Um, that's and a great yes. pitch for poker, by the way. It's just like, if I can figure <laughs> out this game, I have the answer to life. It's just like, That's perfect. exactly. And <laughs> I didn't it. even have to think of it. John von Neumann <laughs> thought of it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, let me look at, to, look, let's look at this poker thing, right? Let, let's actually see what this key to life is all about. Mm. Um, and so I started reading on poker, um, started, you know, watching some videos, just seeing what is poker? Like, what is this whole poker thing? And, you know, something, sometimes things just click. And I thought, you know what? can this be a way in? Can I learn to play poker? And can I actually use that as the book? Have that be the backbone? Can I find someone really, really good to teach me? And then, you know, take a year, learn the game, have a nice story arc. You know, I was going to play the main event in the World Series, have that be the grand finale, but really use it as a way to explore chance. And mm. that's how the book was initially conceived. Of course, that's not what the book became. Um, it became right. a very, very different journey. Um, but that's what brought me to poker to begin with. Thank you, John von Neumann. <laughs> that's that's. I'm gonna have to pick up that book. I like the frameworks as well. I'm, I'm gonna have to check out uh, some of his work. Yeah, it's a hard. It's not an easy read. It's not the most eloquent book in the world, but mm. it's it's very right. interesting. <laughs> He's a very. He was a very deep thinker. He was not a writer. Right. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll be warned going into it. Yes. Um, <laughs> but he has some really great turns of phrase in it. Um, there's one quote that I um, that I think I'm gonna misquote him now because. I don't have it in front of me, but it's something along the lines of real life consists of bluffing, of little tactics of deception, of figuring out what does that man think I mean to do? And that's what mm. games are about in my theory. And I remember reading that and be like, ooh, mm. this is cool. And that's why poker, obviously. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. So I'm I'm curious as as a journalist going into poker, like you yeah. you're probably used to taking on these big tasks you know nothing about and trying to come into them and give them an honest shake. But yep. I imagine you're human as well. So what, what what were your conceptions of poker coming into it? Like, what did you think about the game from the outside? Uh, you know, I had no real conceptions because I just had no idea what it was, hmm. honestly. I mean, the first, <laughs> the first time I met Eric Seidel, who went on to become you know, my coach, a mentor, and now is just a good friend. Um, and... And also someone with whom I can review hands, which is just kind of amazing because <laughs> he's just absolutely brilliant. Um, but when I first met him, um, I remember telling him, you know, I really don't know anything about cards. Um, you know, I know that there are 54 cards in a deck, but um, that's about it. And I just saw his face change a little. And I'm like, well, what's for, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I didn't. So I didn't even know how many cards were in a deck. So my preconception actually had the jokers in the deck, apparently. I... I get confused, 52, 54, you know, it's, it's pretty similar. close, right? Pretty close. Combo pretty close. schmambos, whatever. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Pot odds, schmod odds, you know, how many outs I have, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just count those two extras and, uh, and I'll call, we'll call it a day. <laughs> um, but I definitely did think that it was going to be still, you know, very much like Texas Hold'em. Mm. Like one of the first books I, I read when I, um, when I started kind of researching this world and seeing, you know, oh, you know, do I want to dive into this world was um, Amarillo Slim, um, his, right. his book. Um, and I think it's called In a World Full of Fat People, something like that. Mm. Um, and it's Slim's uh, autobiography. Obviously, it's ghostwritten. He didn't write it. Um, but I, it's kind of this old, old poker 
uh, world, right. you know, where everyone is carrying guns and knives and is wearing hats and um, is out to get each other and people are cheating um, and all this stuff is going on. That was, and that's what I actually kind of thought I was getting into in a way. Mm. Um, Eric, luckily, you know, Eric Seidel <laughs> yeah. really um, <laughs> breaks through a lot of those stereotypes pretty damn quickly. <laughs> right. I, w I want to talk about Eric Seidel because I have to be honest, coming into the book, I had some misconceptions about Eric Seidel. You know, I'd heard <laughs> that he didn't like whole cards being shown on on uh, TV. And I am a streamer. You know, that mm -hmm. I built my life around like showing my whole cards. So I had my guard up against who Eric yeah. Seidel was. And I've become the biggest fan of the guy through reading your book. Like he <laughs> is amazing and and he is <laughs> there's no there's no access to eric seidel like how do you find out about eric seidel y you can't this is like a great way to actually encounter who he is and i'm just fascinated by him as a human he's, he seems yeah, amazing he's, he is amazing um i talk about luck talk about lucking out like I had no idea that I had this like gold mine. That's what I wanted to I... know. Like, how did you choose him? Like, how did you find well, Eric Seidel? So, so at the time, um, so this was late 2016. Um, and at the time he was still, when I was looking um, up kind of all this information, by the way, I didn't know what the Hendon mob was or anything, but you know, you get there pretty quickly when you start Googling, you know, overall winnings, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and he was still number one on that overall list. He still had it uh, drop down right now. I think he's number three or four. I don't remember. Mm. Um, but anyway, um, these things change obviously all the time. But then I actually um, started looking him up because I looked up all the top players to try to figure out, you know, who'd be a good match. You know, these are clearly these are the best players. Now I obviously know that that's not the only ranking you're supposed to look at, but Right. You know, at, at the time, talk about preconception. I was like, okay, these are the 10 best players in the world, the top 10 on the Hendon yeah, Mom. Here we yeah. go. Let's right. go down the list. Um, and I actually, I didn't know a single poker name. The only poker name I knew was Phil Ivey. Um, somehow he'd managed to make it into my, but I didn't know Phil Helmuth. I didn't know Negrano. I didn't know any of the poker players. I certainly didn't know Eric Seidel. Um, and I just started researching all of them. And I saw, I was like, oh my God, he's been around since the 80s. And he's been winning, like, holy shit, he has first place, first place, first place, year after year after year. The guy is crazy good. Is anyone mm. else like that? And I started looking at the other people, and the answer was no. People had, you know, done really well at one point and then dropped off. There were people who were very famous in the 80s who no one knows about today. Same with the 90s. And a lot of the people in the top lists um, were much younger than Eric. There are people who were, you know, who'd who hadn't had that sort of longevity. So that was one of the things. Then I also realized that he was the guy in the visor from Rounders, and I thought that was pretty damn cool. Yeah. Um, so I was like, ooh, ooh, red visor guy. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, so, so that was um, obviously, that was a crucial factor. That was probably the single deciding factor that he, was, that he had that visor. Um, but then I also looked at some videos, and he just looked nice. He was quiet. He was just really humble, unassuming. You know, he never, it seemed to me that he basically just never said a word. It, mm. it ends up, it's pretty, that's pretty true. Like he doesn't really talk <laughs> much at the poker table. Um, and he just would win and win hand after hand. And some of the other players um, seemed like, you know, they were, could be abrasive. Like they were, mm. you know, not, not necessarily like nice people with whom I'd want to spend a lot of time so that was a factor and finally i want i didn't want someone who was like a, a young mathematics person because the last math class i took was in high school um you know i can do basic math but that's about it um i don't remember anything and i know you know i know what i don't know and i knew that if i have a limited amount of time um, I need to play to my strengths, which is psychology. So mm. I need someone with that kind of a, a main approach. Obviously, I've learned that they're not antagonistic, that you can use and should use both. Um, but I wanted someone who wasn't going to be like, okay, you know, use these spreadsheets, you know, right. download, download yeah. this, do that, because I can't compete with that. You know, that's, that's, um, that's not something that I could pick up quickly. I mean, eventually, I did end up using solvers and all of that, but it mm. took me a while to get to that point. And it's still not my strong suit. 
Yeah, I, I so, remember so you mentioned uh, Phil Galfond and like Jason Kuhn in the <laughs> yep. book and some of the people that helped you along the way, uh, yep. on, more on the, the mathematical side as well. Uh, yeah, but that's I, that's how I came to Eric and he somehow agreed, yeah. He's, I think he's perfect. Like he's a perfect pick, and uh, I'm honestly mad at myself for the the preconceived judginess that I built when I was 19 and 20. That he was just like a kind of a grumpy dude, because the depictions <laughs> in the book of like jazz clubs and like reading interesting literature and flying around to like these cultural centers. Now I'm just envious. I just want to be. Yeah. I just want to be him now. So. Oh yeah, uh, I think I think if everyone were Eric Seidel, the world would be a much better place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree. Um, so, so I want to ask you if I, your book talks a lot about what is skill and chance, and that's a, the central mm -hmm. theme, really, of, of of the whole discussion. So, if someone comes up to you and mm -hmm. asks you the question, "Well, is poker all skill or is it all luck?" What's what's the bite sized answer that you give that person <laughs> off the street that asks you the question? Yeah, I say that like anything, it's both. I mean, there's nothing in life that's all skill. If anyone tells you something is all skill, that's bullshit mm. uh, because luck is always a factor. Um, I say that poker is not gambling, that it's a game of skill. And I have a one sentence answer for that, which is that in poker, you can win with the worst hand and lose with the best hand. Mm. And that's not possible in any other game in the casino. Um, where you have to have the best hand to win. So that shows you that it's a game of skill. But then which one is more of a factor depends at your time horizon. So, you know, as with all probabilities, as with all statistical phenomena, um, variance only plays out over the long term, mm. right? So you never know where you are in a distribution. You know, if you have a coin, right, and you flip it, you know, it's supposed to be 50-50, but you might flip it 10 times and it might come up heads nine times or even 10 times. And, but if you flip it a hundred times, it will, will start getting closer to 50, 50, a thousand times, even closer, 10,000 times, a hundred thousand, right? That's when you start seeing the real probabilistic distribution come out. So poker is the same way. You have some sort of a skill edge and you are going to the, over time, over the long term, players who are more skilled are going to make more money and players who are just lucky and are running well are going to disappear and go broke. In the short term, I could play again. I could play heads up against Eric and win. That does not mean that I'm a better player than Eric. It mm -hmm. means that I just lucked out. Um, and in one game, yeah, that might happen. But if we were to play 10 times, he's going to kick my ass. Um, if, he, if we play, you know, 100 times, he's definitely going to kick my ass. So anything can happen in one hand in one game in one tournament anyone can get lucky and luck in the immediate term is actually a very big factor but over the long term the longer you go um the the longer the horizon that you're looking at the more skill dominates and luck recedes because that's what you need i mean in order to cancel variance you need volume mm. that's good i like the answer i'm gonna, I'm gonna copy that. <laughs> um so i don't want to spoil the book I, I've never done a book <laughs> conversation podcast before. This is my first. I'm really liking it. This is good. Um, Thank you. So Thank I'm you. not going to say the heights you obtained in poker, but they're they're really nice. Like you've, you've yes. had some, some great results in the game over a short couple years. So looking at your very short and successful poker career, <laughs> what, are you, what are you most proud of? And then also do you look back on a moment as like your biggest failure and, and a learning point in your journey? Um, I think that, I mean, it's hard, it's hard not to, I mean, it, it's, it's fine to spoiler this in the sense okay, that it's, I'll let it's you common it. knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard not to say, you know, winning the PCA national championship wasn't my proudest moment. I mean, it's a major international event. It was a major final table. I was playing against, you know, people like Chris Moore, uh, Chris Mormon and Harrison Gimbel and, you know, some of the best players, best tournament players in the world. Um, and it was, you know, it was a very surreal moment. And the fact that I ended up winning was just absolutely crazy. Um, mm. And that was, I mean, and I, and I was so proud that I could do that. Um, and I knew, you know, everyone says that you need to play well to win a tournament, but you also have to get lucky. Um, and I think people forget just how much you have to get lucky. Luckily, both because this was a final table, so all the hands were recorded, mm -hmm. um, and also because I was taking notes along the way. I know that I shouldn't have won. I mean, 
I, there was one moment, there was one hand in particular where, you know, I got in sevens against aces pre-flop, you know, that should have been the, that should have been it. And mm. I was the shorter stack. That should have been my last hand. I should have been out in whatever it was, fifth place. Um, and I sucked out. I mean, I ended up hitting a straight. I didn't even hit a set. I went the roundabout way. We got, <laughs> we got a straight on the board and, and I doubled instead and then was able to go on to win those tournaments. And I'm very, I was very well aware of that. You know, I knew that I had worked hard and I played well, but I'd made some really big mistakes. Um, and that one, that particular one wasn't a mistake. I just got unlucky. You know, I had 10 big blinds in the small blind. What am I, you know, what, what am I doing? Mm. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that one was just, was just a, a suck out, but I, I made some big mistakes too. I misplayed hands and I know that. Um, and so afterwards I really, you know, the book doesn't end there. That's not kind of the, that is not the final page of the book because I needed to prove to myself that there was more skill there than luck, or at least that skill was still a factor. So I kept playing and I kept putting myself out there to see, you know, can I replicate the success? Yeah. And in, in some ways it's not a moment, but the fact that I could, the fact that I actually went on to have some pretty big results after that, um, I think I'm more proud in a way, in a strange way, I'm more proud of that because to me that kind of, that made it seem like that one moment wasn't just a fluke, yeah. um, that it wasn't just that I completely lucked out. Um, so I think that, 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 that was, that's really important to me. But for one, if I'm picking like one moment, of course, winning that tournament changed the whole trajectory of my poker career. I mean, I wouldn't have gotten a sponsorship from PokerStars. I wouldn't have you know, joined Team Pro. I would, like none of, none of that would have happened, I think, without that win. Because people just, the media doesn't cover second place the way they cover first no. place yeah um it's not a great story like journalist comes in second like okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great, that's great. <laughs> unless it's a main event then it's a then it's a big story but unless it's the wsop main event like nobody cares yeah. um so so that um that was a, a defining thing and are there things that um i would change i mean absolutely every single day when i review even my play from the day before i i find lots of mistakes and lots of things i do differently um but the moments i think that i really wish i could take back aren't the mistakes in play because that happens and that's how you learn and that's how you grow um and i think that that's you know making mistakes is essential if you if you never you know, if you never make mistakes, you're not noticing your mistakes, hmm. I think is, is the bottom line. Right. Yes. So, so, um, so I'm not, I'm not ashamed or, you know, I, I wouldn't take back my mistakes. I think they've made me who I am. They've made me the player I am. Some of the moments I would take back, like the lowest moments were moments when I actually tilted, like when I let someone get to me, when I let emotion really get the better hmm. of me. Um, and snapped at someone. Um, and those are, those are situations where I wish I could go back and kind of use some of the self-control techniques that uh, I have at my disposal and actually not do that and think more clearly and kind of be the bigger person. Sometimes I'm not, some of those moments I don't take back. Sometimes I was calling people out for things that needed calling out. Right. But sometimes, sometimes I just let someone get to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a per that's kind of a personal failing that um, I'd like to work on. You know, I, I think it's really important to try to always be the the bigger person and to not um, to not stoop to the level of, right. of people who are trying to goad you and get to you. Yes. Well, I'm I'm going to ask the the cliche question then, which is. Uh... I mean, I, I always seem to have to ask when I have female guests on the show, which is like <laughs> poker is not a particularly um, open or accessible game for women. It's it's like very aggressive and masculine and not very wel welcoming. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you talk about in the book, we have two to three percent of the people that play poker are women. You know, like that's ridiculous yeah. when it it's a game ridiculous. with with your brain. So do you have any thoughts in regards to what what poker as an industry as a community needs to do to like fix what's broken or or is it just what it is like what do you think about it um i think that i think that it isn't what it is i mean it can't be what it is because mm. i think that women should be welcome in the game women can bring so much to the game um women 
I think can thrive in the game and be amazing players. And poker has given me a lot. I mean, I think it's made me um, a much more powerful female. Um, I think it's actually enabled me to kind of reach certain elements of my personality, find inner aggression that I wouldn't have otherwise found, um, fix things about myself um, that I didn't realize needed fixing. So I do hope that more women um, come to the game, but I do think that certain things need to change. I mean, I describe in the book multiple moments where um, things did not go very well at the table um, mm. in terms of being female. Um, and people weren't on my side. So I think that more people need to speak up when they see something wrong, they need to actually find their voice and say something is wrong. Um, I had floor staff who weren't on my side. So there was a moment where I was actually propositioned, like actually propositioned at the table mm. where someone said that they would pay me a few buy-ins to go up to their room. And I was just, I was horrified and I called the floor it was in, the, in the middle of a tournament and the floor said there was nothing they could do. And then they they said that, you know, well, we can move you to another table. And as any tournament player knows, like that's punishing you. Yeah. You know, you you should not be have to move to a new table that you no. that you don't know. Um and and that was their response and that was not okay. Um so so I think that those types of things are just so so easy to fix. You know, respond, be on my side, have a protocol for it, and really just try you know, try to be, try to instill a kind of culture that you want to see. So I think as men, you know, 97% of you <laughs> are men. <laughs> so be friendly to women. Don't be condescending to women. Um, don't try to patronize them. There are so many people who are also trying to be helpful. Oh, you're, you're stacking your chips the wrong way. Here, mm -hmm. let me show you how to do it. You know, screw you. Like, <laughs> did, I, <laughs> did I ask you to, st to touch my chips and to show me how I'm supposed to stack them? Um, you know, treat them like, like people and actually be nice to them um, and realize that, yeah, okay, it's no longer my old boys club. And yeah, yeah, maybe some things, some behaviors are no longer appropriate and I have to be a little bit on my guard. So what, you know, that, that's not a big deal. Um, because a lot of a lot of guys are just like, oh, well, I just want to have a good time. You know, why do I have to watch what I say? You know, why can't I call that bitch a bitch because she's a bitch? And, yeah. 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 <laughs> and they just, you know, people like that um, make it harder for everyone. And I totally don't blame, you know, for me, the world changed completely. Um, the world of poker, I mean, because uh, people started to recognize me. You know, I I became of better known and also i had eric on my side and eric introduced me to all of these amazing amazing people who you know are the most supportive of women and so incredibly wonderful um and so that having that support network helped me through those hard times at the beginning when i was playing really low stakes um and i think it's worse at the low stakes by the way because mm. there are um there are just more people who don't care. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Um, but not everyone has that, right? Not everyone has an Eric Seidel on one shoulder and a Phil Galfond on the other and a Jason Kuhn standing behind you <laughs> to, to try to shield you and yeah. tell you that you can do this. So I'm lucky that I had that and that they made me love the game, see the game for what it was and want to kind of move up and do better um, and stick to it. But I see why a lot of women would be discouraged. So it's at those lower stakes that I think the biggest problems are. And unfortunately, I think a lot of those players um, would even listen to this and say, what's that bitch talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen it in my own games. I remember playing one, two cash games. And mm -hmm. I, I can think about a woman sitting down at the table. And it's such an event to the table. It, it, for some reason, it's just like, oh, there's a woman sitting down. It's like, why is this such an event? Like what you're saying is what I've come to learn after time. Like, oh, there, it's a person, you know, like it's not yep. an event. It's just a human. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it, it feels like that in live cash games, particularly in live tournaments, it's a, it's a thing. So I, I've tried to, in my head, flip around. Like what if I walked into a poker room and yeah. basically every table I sat down with was eight women and myself. Like. I would feel a little intimidated, honestly. Yeah. Um, and 
And so I, I understand like the difficulty of women getting into a game that is so predominated and difficult to get into. So yeah, um, I think um, great so advice. I hope, I hope that changes. I yeah. hope that changes. And I hope my book helps change it too. Um, in the sense that maybe women will read it and say, oh, like maybe I can do this too. And I think we have such amazing, you know, we have some amazing spokespeople um, for, for the game mm. and some amazing women in the game. I mean, Chrissy Becknell is just, just a beast. Yeah. She, and she is one of the kindest, most lovely people ever. And she's crushing it with, you know, in the high rollers. I mean, she's one of the best players in the world, mm. male or female. Um, and I hope that, you know, I hope that people can see that um, and can respect it and can say, wow, you know, we have these great role models and you have, and you have these, like you have people like Liv, um, Liv Bury. I mean, I'm guessing yeah. anyone knows who Liv is, yeah. but like, <laughs> um, you know, who, who does videos about astrophysics. Like, yeah. I there mean, are, we're not just, lacking in, in the great ambassadors uh, for women in poker. Some we're not. Phenomenal female ambassadors. And yet. Um, they're still, still 3%. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I've already, I could, I could talk to you all day, Maria, but I know you have a book coming out pretty soon, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. Uh, I'll ask you one more question because this isn't your yeah. only book. This isn't your first book. I have two of your other books here. I haven't read yet. Mastermind <laughs> and Confidence Game. They're on the list. I'm ready to go. Um, wow. Thank you. <laughs> so, so perhaps with some parting wisdom to the audience, uh, coming from studying cons in the confidence game, yeah. uh, and I would guess inductive reasoning in the in the uh, the Sherlock Holmes mastermind. Very good, very good. Okay. Because most people would say deductive re reasoning, but as you know, Sherlock Holmes used inductive reasoning. It's English one thousand there. Thank you to well my prof. Well done. Well done. Um, <laughs> is there anything you encountered in poker from what you learned in these books yeah. that you feel as if the poker world is doing? really wrong. I love the idea of taking people at the top of their craft in, in other areas and trying to mix and match some of the philosophies to figure out if they're, if yeah. we're behind in a certain way. So did anything stand out in that regard? I mean, I think there are two things and it's not the poker world. It's a lot of people um, in the poker world because there are some people who are doing it right. Mm. Right. There are always some exceptions and some people who are doing it right. Um, but um, the thing that underlies mastermind my sherlock holmes book yes it's about inductive reasoning it's about you know about sherlock holmes's thought processing but it's also and i think more fundamentally it's about mindfulness about really being present about really paying attention really being in the moment um because you know i think that that's the main difference between Holmes and Watson and why Holmes is able to be such a great detective. There's a sentence that inspired the whole book where Holmes tells Watson, asks Watson how many steps lead up to 221 B Baker Street. Watson doesn't know. And Holmes says, that's the difference between us. I, you only see, I both see and observe. Um, and that just encapsulates the mm. difference in approach, mindlessness and mindfulness. And you have no idea how many of the best poker players are mindless. They are not seeing and observing. They're just seeing. You know, they're on their phone. They're on Twitter. They have a false sense of confidence. At the highest levels, it comes from solvers. It, it comes from the fact that they know what they're supposed to do um, in all of these different spots. So they feel like, oh, I don't need to pay attention to all of these. I can, you know, I can check the sports scores. I can check on this. I can check on that. Um, and then you have the players who are obviously at the who do pay attention and who mm. are very present and very mindful. I just think it's undervalued. Um, I think that if we infuse everything we do at the poker table with mindfulness, we'll be better players, better people, and it will also be actually a much more welcoming environment. Because if you actually reflect before you act um, or before you speak, so certain things <laughs> might be avoided um, if you take if you take that moment. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Um, and I think the other uh, the other thing that um, I see a lot of players doing. I hate to I hate to say doing wrong, but that I think that is not necessarily optimal mm. is just being too hyper focused um, on poker. Um, and if they're kind of using solver approaches on solvers, and they just you know that's what they do, and everything else is just to like blow off steam, blow off steam. Like they might you know watch some video, play some video games, or like watch some sports. Um, because they have money on the game, but it's right. all kind of 
but but poker is the only thing where they're really actively engaging their mind. Um, and I think that one of the things I've learned both from Mastermind and from the Confidence Game is that the people who tend to be the best are the people who have a lot of interests, who are well-rounded, who live life, who actually do things and experience things, who know how to step away. I mean, poker players are so bad um, at the high levels. Of, they're so bad at taking time off. I mean, they, <laughs> yeah. they play every single day. Yes. And yeah. I think it's so important to just step back and gain perspective and gain some mental clarity and take breaks, you know, to take, take a, you know, some people think it's insane, but for instance, last year at the World Series, I, took a long weekend and ended up not being able to play like five events because that long weekend interfered with them um, and went to California. Um, and it was wonderful. And I think that everyone should do that <laughs> or not necessarily to California, but to actually you know, take mental breaks and engage with the world, engage with other things. It's gonna give you perspective. It's gonna make you better at poker ultimately because you're, you'll be refreshed. You'll have more material and more things that you bring with yourself to the game. And I think that that's really important and that's also undervalued. And that's something that um, I don't see people doing, especially when you get to something like the World Series, they're there to grind. Mm. And so they're gonna grind, yeah. you know, they're gonna do it for six weeks straight. Um, and they think it works for them um, and they think, you know, no, this is how you do it. And sure, some of them have bracelets and good results. But I am willing to put money on the fact that they would become be better and have better results if they actually took some breaks. I think it's I think it's good. I love it. Uh, Maria, the biggest bluff coming out on June 15th. I honestly you June have to pick up the book June 23rd, June 23rd. Yes. I'm sorry. June, All good. June 23rd. Pre-order it on the 15th for the 23rd. Um, where can people follow along with your with your journey? I, I mean, whatever happens next, like where can they keep <laughs> up with you? So I do have a website, um, mariakonnikova.com, but I update it about once every five years. Um, so that's probably <laughs> not the best place. Um, I'm mostly on Twitter and Instagram. Those are the two platforms where I'm most active. On Twitter, I'm mkonnikova. And on Instagram, I'm girl named Maria, except girl does not have an I. It's just GRL, mm. um, not because I don't know how to spell, but because someone had already snagged girl named Maria with an I. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, and yeah, hopefully we can do it again soon. Thank you, Jamie. It's been wonderful. And yes, anytime you want, um, I'm happy to come back. Thanks so much to Maria for taking the time this week. Before I let you all go, we have a weekly competition here. $215 Party Poker Million ticket is up for grabs. Now, there's actually a new structure to the Party Poker Million. We've slowed down the tournaments so that you've got a little bit more time to play. Uh, the day two has moved to Monday so that you have enough time to play the tournament throughout the day. So it's a much deeper and well-structured event so it's not too short and flippy at the end of the tournament. I think something that most of you will appreciate. And the other thing is, instead of it being multiple flights a day, there's only one flight a day now. There's one on Monday night, one on Tuesday night, one on Wednesday night, there's day 1A, day 1B, day 1C, et cetera, right? It's very limited. Um, so it is a much better structured field and tournaments uh, should be much better value than people re-entering all the time. You just have limited choices to get in. So uh, the question of the week is, um, what time will the nightly day ones take place in the new format and i'm going to put this in uk time all right uk time what time will the nightly day ones take place in the new format i know this is increased complexity for those of you that are guessing over in canada or those of you guessing in germany it's hard you got to convert your time i'm sorry i'm currently in edinburgh so this is an added bonus uh, difficult section for you. It's just the way it is. One of you is going to win a $215 million ticket. You're going to represent the podcast, and I hope you get second place in the tournament. That's it for the podcast this week. Thank you all so much for watching. If you're listening on iTunes, make sure to subscribe and leave a review and a rating. That would help us out in a big way. Spotify, thanks for doing your Spotify thing. You just chill out vibe it out on Spotify and on YouTube. Of course, if you're watching the video version, like, comment, and subscribe to the channel you're watching on would be absolutely great uh, to ensure that this podcast keeps rolling because I'm loving it. I get to talk to amazing people, learn what they have to say, and that's it. What a win, you know? I love it. Thank you all so much for checking out the show. That's it for this week, but until next week, we'll see you later.